Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. In this episode, we're joined by Gail Cameron Westcott, who was the narrator commentator in 2013 for a program that the Houston Chamber Choir presented entitled Requiem for a President. Gail, welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm most flattered to be included. You are in Atlanta, I believe? Yes, yes, in, a, in Georgia, in a very key state now. We're sort of in election recovery, as everyone else is, but we're not right. used to being such a key part of things. <laughs> Tell us about the, the program, the Houston Chamber Choir program that you were involved with, Requiem for a President. What was your role? Well, I had, had uh, covered the assassination of the president uh, for Life magazine. And so Bob asked me to, he, it was sort of done in a, a, a <clears throat> kind of a, I, I introduced what it had been like for, the, for Kennedy to be, um, to be covering Kennedy in the first place, you know, right. what, it, what it had meant to all of us in the, you know, covering the campaign and then, and went through several segments like that. And then during the White House years, and then talked about the assassination. And then in the second half, the choir sang the Duraflay Requiem and it was absolutely incredible. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite so beautiful. So it's amazing that then year, now years later to win the Grammy with Duraflay. Now, as you said, you, were, I was going to say, fairly intimate with um, JFK and, and Jackie Kennedy. You had covered them since the, uh, since before he was nominated. Yes, yes. Just, uh, I was a young reporter at Life magazine. Uh, and one afternoon, it was kind of just in June, it was like rush up to to uh, Gracie Mansion because he was about to appear at some reception there. It looked like he was gonna get the nomination. And I had not met him. I went tearing up there with a photographer and it was just amazing. He was electrifying. And we then began covering from then on uh, until the, and during the, when he was nominated, uh, I was covering Jackie, it was when I first met Jackie. She did not go, she was pregnant with her son. <laughs> And uh, he, they, uh, it was in Los Angeles. And so I went to Hyannisport and we were the only ones inside the house. We just had wonderful connections with her from the very beginning. And it was Life Magazine at that time was just a big, the most powerful magazine in the world really at that point. And so we did have access that was not always afforded others. We were very lucky that way. And, and it went on from there. You ended up, I think, staying at Hyannis Port. Well, it, it, we, in, the, in the fall, we, we were doing a, an, a, a portrait of Jackie and uh, with interviews and, and I arrived with Alfred Eisenstadt and actually uh, her, and we were just there. This would not happen today um, right. to just be there with, there was no press aids, no anything. We just arrived. And uh, we were with Jackie and Caroline was very young, a little girl. And we were just, just there and a hurricane literally uh, uh, came to Hyannisport and we were just tearing around and lighting candles, the electricity went off. And uh, this was a very significant day. It was September 12th, uh, 1960. And uh, that was the day that, pres that the, with Senator Kennedy was in Houston he was addressing Houston ministers about his Catholicism, which at the time was a very controversial, it would be the first Catholic president, was he going to be ingratiated to the Pope, all of those, he was trying to settle those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, we meanwhile were in Hyannisport, and, and then with that a tree fell in front of our car, we were blocked. So we were there all evening and indeed, yes, did spend the night. And it was so, we, we came to know each other quite well. And I, I thought afterwards, I remember, I remember 
President, Ken not, well, he wasn't president yet, Senator Kennedy calling from Houston saying it all went well. And Jackie afterwards said, he never mentioned our anniversary. It turned out that was their wedding anniversary. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I then, but of course it was, you know, Ted Sorensen said afterwards, his speechwriter said that he felt this was perhaps the most significant day in the entire campaign mm. uh, in terms of the tide of public opinion. And uh, so the fact that he forgot the anniversary was probably not significant. I remember saying, in a most improbable way. Well, tomorrow's my birthday, which had nothing to do with anything, but we just sort of began drinking wine and talking and there was, there was candlelight and it was quite an amazing evening. Uh, but- uh, Were you with Mrs. Kennedy? Uh, she watched the, uh, the, the, her husband accepting the democratic nomination on television. She wasn't able to be there because she was pregnant. Right. And she was doing a painting. She was actually, it, it's hard for anyone even to imagine. Uh, she was doing a painting uh, to, to welcome him back. She was watching television, which was on a literally a rented set. I mean, there was not even a television set in her house uh, in Hyannisport, at that, which is part of the Kennedy compound. And it was just a very informal evening. It just you know, went on and on. Her parents were there. And, and then we were there and that was all. And it was just a, 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 it was amazing. You know, and the next day she appeared on the, on the veranda of the Kennedy house and it was, uh, and then there was a huge press contingent there. But no, that night she was just alone uh, in her house with us. And what was her reaction? She was thrilled. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. I mean, I think she had, well, I should say, um, looking back on it, uh, I'm sure she she was thrilled, but she was apprehensive. It was a feeling of losing her privacy, of mm -hmm. uh, that she was now going to be a public figure, which she wasn't quite prepared to be. And uh, I mean, she, it was there was sort of a naive quality. There were people banging on the door of the press. There was no one there to help her. No press aides. You know, and she turned to us saying, what should I do? Should I, you know, have people come in? Of course, we said no, because we were having. <laughs> <laughs> we want the exclusive. Exactly. And so, um, but I mean, nowadays there would be so, you know, such an entire contingent of, of aides for the whole thing. It would not, not, not be that informal. But so that, and that continued that way throughout the whole, cover, our, throughout our coverage of her, right through to the assassination, actually. But, um, you also covered the inauguration, didn't you? The Kennedy inauguration. Yes, indeed. It was, this was an amazing time. I mean, we were, you know, up until then for, uh, for my generation, you know, presidents had all been very old. Now it's odd to say that since we now have the oldest president elect, <laughs> yeah. but um, at that time, uh, presidents had all been very old, and suddenly, when 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 Kennedy came onto the scene, it was just electrifying. You know, he was young. Suddenly, we were all involved in a way we had never been involved before, and uh, it was just it was a very exciting and very exhilarating time. I feel very lucky to have been part of it. So, did you get to interact with President Kennedy? Oh yes, yes, indeed. He was he he well he actually he he liked the press, imagine, mm -hmm. <laughs> very different from nowadays. I mean, he was a very, uh, he enjoyed the press. Uh, we were there when the baby was born, John, John uh, uh, Jr. But, uh, and he was, he was, he, but he was joking all the time with us. You know, it was a very congenial atmosphere. You said that um, when he came to Gracie Mansion, you said that he was electrifying. What was it about him that was electrifying? Well, you know, there are certain people, I've sort of covered an awful lot of people in the course of many decades, and there are people that are, are just uh, that charismatic quality. I mean, it, I think of, uh, I never, never met, met President Clinton. I'm told that he had it too, that suddenly the, the, 
the atmosphere in a room changes when someone walks in uh, like, mm -hmm. like, like either one of them. Leonard Bernstein, the same thing. It was just sort of a, the, the temperature changes. It's sort of, been, there's an electrolyte thing that just, I don't know, happens. And it's just, yeah. it's remarkable. And he certainly had it. There was also, there was, it, that, it was a very informal, I have a picture of where we were all down at the edge of, uh, of Gracie Mansion lawn, just, just a few reporters. This is someone who was running to be president of the United States. It, it was just uh, almost casual, you know, it was right. uh, at that point. Before things became so stringent. Yes, indeed. So where were you when you learned that President Kennedy had been assassinated? I was in New York. I was having lunch uh, with uh, a colleague at Life magazine and a waiter came to the, we were at, having lunch and a waiter came in and said, the president was just been shot. And we were around the corner from the Time Life building. We tore out, we tore back to the building and things happened so amazingly fast. It was, uh, I just remember running up and in in getting in the elevator, going up to our floor. An editor came to me and grabbed me and said, get down to Washington. I mean, I was there then when the plane, well, I remember so much about it. The plane was absolutely silent. Uh, it was, it, there was just a kind of shock on the plane. And I, didn't, I had no luggage. I, I just went tearing down. We were mm. suddenly out at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, and and the, when the plane came back from Dallas and seeing Jackie, you know, with the, her blood soaked stockings, it was just an amazing time. And, and, uh, and it all happening that quickly. And, and, that, that, and then we went back to Andrews Air Force Base again that night and uh, the <clears throat> we went back that night, and when when and there was Air Force One, sort of in the distance. It was kind of like a monument. I still remember De Pat Moynihan uh, just sort of putting his arms around me and saying, "You know, things will never be the same again." And it, it was, was a Senator a, Moynihan. Yes, it was. Yes, he wasn't yet Senator Moynihan. He was. Right. He was. Uh, but in the working in the administration, yes. It must have been incredibly difficult for you to cover the assassination for the magazine. It was, but this... yet we all were, yes, it was, it was. And yet the only time I do remember uh, uh, the very next day, uh, we, we, we were covering all the people arriving at the White House from all, it, what, what was amazing that morning, I still remember this scene of, uh, of going into the White House and we were in, in, it was that informal that we were in, in the Oval Office where incredibly the carpet had all been changed already, but that had been planned, but it seemed suddenly that, that uh, the, oh my goodness, so they're changing the carpet, but they were taking, they, we saw the wheelchair, the, the uh, rocking chair being removed. Uh, it was just, uh, and Bobby Kennedy was there in the hallway there. It was all that informal. Uh, but then the next, uh, later that day, I remember being at the executive office building across the street and there were floral arrangements coming in from all over the world, these gigantic, uh, sprays of things and suddenly that's when it did indeed hit me i do remember just my eyes welling up at the very at that very moment lyndon johnson the new president came was coming down the hall with his retinue he saw me standing there crying and sort of put his arms around me saying now little lady everything's going to be just fine and i acted like saying, no, it never will be. It's never will be fine again. You know, and the, the photographer said to me, he's the president of the United States, Gail, you may watch your tone, but um, <laughs> uh, it just didn't, you know, at the time, but we were moving so quickly. And so it's hard when I've talked to younger audiences, I've said that one of the things we were doing so much, we had people had to keep having couriers go to 
the airport with the film. Uh, they oh, they yes. can't understand that film <laughs> and, and uh, having to go to the airport and having to ship it. Life was going to be Life. the first to cover this in color. So, so all television sets were all black and white at that time. Right. So we were, it was just an enormous operation and uh, which ended up incredibly uh, the night after the whole funeral, uh, we were we returned to Arlington because our editor wanted a picture of sort of the grave at alone at sunset. And we got there and what was amazing was <clears throat> that was the grave that had been on television was not the real grave that had been chosen, I think, for cameras and for the just the logistics of it all. And there was the casket just there uh, uh, as they were planning to, to build to dig a new grave. They did dig it, and we sat there for hours as they prepared the new grave. And it was an amazingly surreal experience. But as you know, looking across the Potomac, the lights coming out of the Lincoln Memorial, and, and finally around almost 10.30 or getting close to 11, the grave was prepared. It was up the hill uh, in the, at the Custis Mansion and flowers were placed around it. And we took the picture, the photographer George Silk took the picture. And with that, we saw a limousine coming up along the side road. And it was just very clear that that was gonna be Jackie and probably Bobby, and it was. But this would never happen nowadays. George Silk grabbed my hand. We went slipping and sliding down the hill, not to intrude on them. I think nowadays the picture would have been taken of them. And I think <clears throat> it was just a different time. I, I, I had a, gray, a raincoat that was just covered with grass stains and I never wore it again. 50 years later, as you're narrating this yes. program, for the Houston Chamber Choir. Looking back 50 years later, what were your feelings? It all seemed so immediate still, uh, there was, uh, to me really. And, and hearing, hearing the Duraflay was just so perfect. You know, I just, uh, at the end of it, we, a, a life photographer, who lives in Houston, Bob Gomel, who had also covered much of the assassination, brought pictures that were all on display in another room during after, after the concert. But uh, it, it still is very immediate to me, that whole period. It was a, a period that was very hopeful, very tragic, but stays with me still. You attended Smith College. You're an alumna of Smith College. I did, yes. And you sang in the chamber choir at the college. I did, I did. I, I had uh, not, um, I had, I am growing up, I had played the piano, but had never, I, and had sung in a church choir. Actually, my first choral director was Hugh Ross, who went, uh, this was at a, for just a child's choir at our local Episcopal church. And he went on to found the Scola Cantorum, which performed regularly in New York with uh, the Philharmonic. Uh, so it was amazing to have had him as my first kind of choir director. But uh, when I was in high school, I, I was in a lot of plays, a lot of dramas, and uh, the music department was doing Yeoman of the Guard this is in Scarsdale, New York. I grew up, I am basically in New York, even though we live in Georgia. Um, and we, <clears throat> they needed somebody, they didn't have an, a contralto, they, and I was not a singer. They needed somebody to just sort of play the part of Dame Carruthers, just sort of like Rex Harrison saying the words over the music. And I said, fine. And then it became sort of a life, they, a life changing moment. I was suddenly asked to sing it and I discovered I really did have this alto voice and went on with, I bring it up because the other two parts were played by two friends, the mezzo and the soprano. We all went, ended up at Smith College. <laughs> and uh, 
and sang together in the Smith Chamber Singers, which was founded by an electric conductor named Iva D. Hyatt. She became, uh, she was like Bob. She had amazing hands and just a, a luminous conductor. And she, uh, we were the first group uh, at that time to be singing in Europe. And uh, we, the State Department arranged everything for us. You know, nowadays when we are all traveling, or when we're we traveling again, there's like choir gridlock in Europe. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> but um, at that time, we literally were the only ones doing it, and it was such a remarkable experience. We went through about seven countries and singing to just the. This was this was not all that long after the war, seven or eight years after the war, and we were just treated as. We were, we were these young girls in these long white dresses and singing glorious music in cathedrals. We sang then in, in, in Italy, we sang for thousands of people at a time. And the, the audience reaction, we, were, we realized it was, we, it was because we were young Americans, not just musicians. We then even sang for the Pope at his private residence in the summertime. It was... Uh, yeah. It was a remarkable experience. It was so remarkable that Life magazine did a story on it. Life tours Europe with a college choir. And that's where I sort of saw and began to see a different future for myself. Uh, there was a reporter and photographer who traveled right with us through for about 10 days. And I thought, wow, you know, what a great life that is. Because this was not a time when all that much was expected of young graduates of Smith College. I mean, as to what your future might be, your future was probably going to be a wedding, <laughs> but uh, right. it was, uh, so it was, uh, <clears throat> it was, it was simply wonderful. It changed my life. I wrote a lot of, I went, we, we did it for several summers. We did it, you know, many, even after I graduated, I went, went. and it was experience of like, we were, we would talk to Radio Free Europe and the Voice of America. It was just a, we sang for Marshall Tito on his private island. I mean, it was a Brioni. It was just a, an amazing time. He was the president of Yugoslavia, wasn't he? He was, indeed, yeah. indeed. And uh, afterwards, uh, did I still remember this banquet they held with a wine called Schlivovitz, which is utterly lethal. And they kept toasting the group and we would keep lifting our glasses and drinking to for the toast and by the end of it we, we could barely get on the boat to take us back it was just <laughs> it was amazing but do you remember some of the repertoire that you sang on the european tours we did we we, we sang uh, uh to this day one of my very favorite things is the pergolese stabat mater we sang the bird short communion service. We sang Appalachian folk songs. We sang madrigals. Uh, we kept being asked, uh, and, then we, and then got an arrangement for it. We kept being asked at that time for Oh Susanna. And we thought, oh, really? really, you know? And, uh, but it was, a, it, it was something that, that, particularly in Italy, which somehow everybody knew. I mean, we hadn't, many of us hadn't really even thought about it for many years, but, um, uh, it was, and we sang Bartok. We we had a very varied repertoire depending on on the occasion, and it was. But I still remember the the Stabat Mater as being just so special. And when you moved from uh, New York to Atlanta, you joined the choir at uh, St. Philip's Cathedral, which at is where St. you met Cathedral, where you where met, I met Robert Bob Simpson. Simpson. Yes. Yes. And of course, you well know <clears throat> what a luminous conductor he is. It just, uh, he was simply incredible. Uh, and uh, I then, we became great friends as well and remain so to this day. So I feel very close to the Houston Chamber Choir because when Bob went to Houston, and of course, we missed him terribly here. Yes. But um, but I knew that his dream was to have a professional choir. And, and I remember so well, we were on the phone a great deal as he was thinking about it, forming it, you know, how to proceed. So I feel, 
I was there in sort of the very, very beginning of uh, how it all came to be. And it was at, at many early performances as well. And I traveled with Bob to, I traveled with his cathedral choir uh, for the first tour that he did with them. We went to Prague and to Austria and uh, it was wonderful to sing with him again. And uh, I still think of us, I still think of the Randall Thompson, Alleluia and all these various wonderful pieces. But uh, it, I, the choir is simply, it's just so wonderful that it won the Grammy. Mm. It's um, I think just one of the finest groups I've ever heard in my life, it truly is. Although Bob also, what I love about these podcasts that are happening is the choirs he's introducing from around the country, you know, which are wonderful on the Monday evenings. You know, those are terrific. Yes. As a journalist, uh, as a reporter with uh, yes. Life magazine, you got to cover the first rehearsal of the New York Philharmonic at Lincoln Center with uh, Leonard Bernstein. Yes. Yes, I, I covered the whole opening of what was then Philharmonic Hall. And as you, as people, I guess, <clears throat> maybe not, may not remember, it's been so many, and through so many our, uh, incarnations since then. But right. at the time, uh, you know, Philharmonic Hall, first of all, leaving Carnegie Hall, this fabulous, wonderful place for, the, for this new hall, but the whole idea was that Philharmonic Hall was going to have the greatest acoustic in the history of sound. And uh, of course they were still fiddling with it, I think now after all these years, but it's, it's a, uh, I do remember the, the first rehearsal and the first sounds where Leonard Bernstein sort of uttered more than one expletive, I think, uh, because it was turning out not to be quite. And I was with at the time, the, standing next to the architect, Max Abramovitz, and uh, he kept saying, what is he saying? <laughs> I said, I can't quite hear him. But um, <laughs> it was, uh, but it was, a, it was, a, it was, an, it was thrilling, the actual opening of, of, you know, with the Gloria from the Mrs. Solemnis, and the, it was a wonderful Aaron Copeland, and it was, I can't remember exactly what that piece was, but it was, it was, it was a magnificent occasion, and uh, Although I do remember uh, one of one of your jobs as a life reporter is to always know the names of people that are being photographed at that time. And I do remember to my horror asking a man what his name was. And he said, Eugene Ormandy. And I thought, oh my. He was of course the conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, but he wasn't recognizable to me at that moment. And uh, I apologize profusely, but <laughs> yes, it was, it was, it, but it was, it was wonderful. It was exciting and um, went on to have other experiences there, which I guess I, uh, well, many, many there. You also covered the, uh, the, I guess the professional debut of Andre Watts, who performed yes, with the New York indeed. Philharmonic. That, it was a wonderful story. Um, Glenn Gould <clears throat> had canceled, sort of at the last minute, literally. And uh, Andre Watts was a 16 year old uh, young pianist, young black pianist living in Philadelphia and uh, who had performed, I think for one of the youth concerts of, of Leonard Bernstein's. And, he, he arrived, it was just, it was such a wonderful life story. I mean, his, his, his mother had been, had married a, a GI in the post-war mm -hmm. period. And then- uh, She was Hungarian. Was she Hungarian or-, or I, think, I think so. Yes. Anyway, yes. I still see her, Europe. yes, in my mind's eye. And, um, but he was doing the Blitz first piano concerto and it was just kind of was glorious. The 16 year old was attracting great, you know, attention and, uh, and, it, and it was wonderful. And I then of course had this fairly traumatic aftermath experience. Uh, well, we went, we went, uh, we went to the, the Bernstein's apartment on Fifth Avenue, on, on Park Avenue, 
I still see him saying to Andre Watts, you know, someday, young man, this will all be yours. And uh, looking out over the skyline, it was all, all very exciting. And at the recording session, also at Philharmonic Hall, uh, Leonard Bernstein agreed that we could be there if no pictures were taken during the actual recording, which of course I agreed to. And during the recording, I suddenly heard the sound of a shutter going, <clears throat> of the photographer's shutter closing. It sounded, of course, at that time, like a cannon going off. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I can't even quite to this day describe, I mean, Leonard Bernstein stopped the entire New York Philharmonic and turned around and not to scream at the photographer, but to scream at me. I still can hear him just saying, you gave me your word. You know, Life Magazine is not welcome here ever again. I was seeing my whole future going right down the drain with the, but um, it's it was an ama amazing experience. We did did after all eventually reconcile. Let me put it that way. But um, but it was terrifying. I it was the first time I understood what it was like to be tongue tied. I did go up to him afterwards, and I barely could get a sentence out. I mean, I was trying to apologize. He was so dis he had every right to be disgusted. Nowadays, I think there are such silencers that wouldn't have happened, you know. But at that time, it did and. Um, for the camera, but it was, it was, a, it, Andre Watts, uh, years later, he was the opening concert at a new concert hall at the time here for Georgia Tech. And I went to the concert, of course, and so I had a big reunion with him. And he literally said, do you remember when Lenny yelled at you? And I said, Yes, I really, really do. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and we have, we have remained me. friends, uh, Andre Watts and I. I mean, over the years, we I've seen him on, on a number of occasions, and uh, it's he's been still a performing. Career. Yes, he is. And he teaches at the uh, the Jacob School, University of Indiana, Indiana right. University. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. To 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 be there at the beginning, to see him. Uh, get that that rare opportunity it must have been very special. Well, imagine being 16 years old. It's the New York Philharmonic. Life magazine is covering you. Everybody in the New York, you know, everybody's there. I mean, it just um, it, it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. It was just a, a just one of those great stories. And and uh, um, absolutely. Life magazine is is no longer with us. No, no. Imagine. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it, it, Life magazine succumbed to, to television. The I mean, it was it was the biggest when I was first there. I mean, it was the biggest magazine in the world. It was its impact was huge. When I was growing up, we used to wait for Life magazine to come on Fridays. You know, it was just, a, it was, it had its impact on families was just giant. And, uh, but when television came, came in, advertising all went to television. And in the end, they couldn't, they had the, the largest circulation of any magazine and they could no longer support it. But it was, uh, you know, there, and they had, there's been an alumni society for the Time Life group. Uh, because it was such a close knit group. I mean, there were, there were friendships formed there. It was like a choir. <laughs> people, people really, long after it was over, you know, were still part, were still part of it in many ways. And uh, I, I spoke at actually one of their very last um, gatherings, which I spoke on the, on the subject of the Beatles. It was their, the anniversary of the Beatles, and uh, which I had also covered at great length. And uh, uh, I had covered the Beatles, uh, which was only just a few months after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I always felt that there was some connection in terms of, it was like the entire country began to laugh again, uh, you know, after the uh, despair, after the assassination. But um, Because they came to the U.S., I think it was February of 64, 1964. February 7th. <laughs> yes, I remember the day. Yes, I do. Well, I do. It was 
the night before, actually, we were doing a story on on John Cage, um, and because he had, he had come up with this idea of the of a of a conductor, a mechanical conductor at the mm -hmm. New York Philharmonic, and what it really looked like, it was very difficult. We never did do the story because it was a, and we never did run it because it it looked like a, it was just looked like a huge metronome. You know, it was just a going back and forth and the, and the, at any rate, that was the, that, that night and the very next morning I was on my way to Kennedy airport and it was a, a Friday morning and it was a school day, but I think if any high school student in the entire Metro area was, <laughs> was in school, I can't believe it because I, to this day, I can hear the, the sound of, of the screaming, you know, of, of and before the ever even before the plane even landed, it was just amazing. And uh, there were there were four limos, one for each Beetle, and uh, one for each for publications like Time, Life, Newsweek, Saturday Evening Post, not a television channel, which is interesting. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, <clears throat> I. I had the, the, the pass for life and was literally picked up by the police and just hurled into the limo, landing on the floor, losing my shoes in the process. I was screaming, a beetle landed on top of me, which who turned out to be Ringo. And I'm screaming about my shoes. The police are banging on the, on the car saying, you know, get going, you know, and uh, it was me, and Ringo was saying, "I'll get the shoes," you know, and and uh, I don't know if he got the shoes. Someone got the shoes, you know, and and uh, that's how it all began. And Life magazine literally, if one of one of their less astute news judgments, we were going to cover them for literally one day. Uh, our managing editor said, "This is just a." It's like the hula hoop. It's just going to go away. It'll just well. Of course, fifty <laughs> years later, we're, yes, we're still still talking about them. And um, I've stayed with them through New York, uh, Washington, back to New York, you know, down to Miami, to London, to Scotland. Uh, it just, uh, and Shea Stadium later that year, it just was an amazing period. And I love their music and so did Leonard Bernstein, as a matter of fact, you know, who. Well, he uh, had very Catholic tastes, didn't he, Leonard? He did, he did, which is yeah. it would made him wonderful. Um, no, because well, we we had a we literally had a call. They put on a concert at the last minute, and at, at Carnegie Hall uh, after the Sullivan Show, which of course had been had attracted the widest audience in the history of television. And yeah. with the other the other wonderful factoid about that was that during the time that they. Beatles were performing on the Ed Sullivan show. Not one crime was committed in the city of New York, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> rock and roll is not uh, all bad then. Right. But um, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Liverpool. So uh, for, for uh, three or four years, I was I was steeped in Beatles. During culture. that period. No, 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 no. This was in, I was at a university in the uh, the early 80s, 1980s, by wow. which time, of course, they, they had split up. So, the, so did you ever go to the cavern? Um, no, because the, the cavern uh, closed. Oh, did and, it? Yes. And we used to go to one of the clubs that they played at, I think even either while they were playing at the cavern at the same time they were playing at the cavern or before they played at the cavern. It was called the Blue Angel Club. And uh, we used to go there occasionally, but uh, you know, you could go to uh, Strawberry Fields and um, Penny Lane. Uh, we used to catch the bus from the, uh, the halls of residence into the university and uh, it would go past Penny Lane. And the really? funny thing, about, yeah, the funny thing was that the uh, the city council had they were so tired of people stealing the uh, the street sign that said Penny Lane <laughs> that what they ended up doing was was painting it on the side of the uh, of, of the building 
so that it couldn't be uh, it couldn't be taken, couldn't be stolen, couldn't be removed, couldn't be removed. Right. Their effect was enormous. It was just mm -hmm. uh, incredible. I mean, even now it stuns me, and I still love their music. I mean, it's just. Uh, uh, I well, never, but I never did go to Liverpool, and, and we actually lived in uh, London for several years in in the early seventies. But um, uh, I never, I did never did get to Liverpool to the to the shrines of the uh, of the Beatles. Beatles. Yeah. Well, Gail, are you still singing? I am not. I've become sort of an alto emeritus, I think. <laughs> um, I, uh, of course, no one is singing right now, but but the, but yet I'm still terribly involved in the choir. Uh, I think there's the community of a choir is to me just one of the great experiences of all life. It's um, I've often said, you know, you can be stressed and exhausted beyond words, but I would find just even walking into the choir room you suddenly, everything changes, you know, and then the involvement in the music is so huge. It's just as, uh, uh, but, but I, oh goodness, I sang with them for almost 30 years, I think. And uh, wow. uh, the whole time we've been in Atlanta and uh, uh, <clears throat> we sang at Westminster Abbey in St. Paul's as, as Bob's choir has done as well. But. Uh, so when you, narrated Requiem for a President yes. for the Houston Chamber Choir. What was it like to be standing on that stage with that choir and not having to sing? <laughs> well, of course I would love to have been singing. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was so stunned. I had come, I had been I had heard the choir many times, well, not many times, but certainly I'd come down for the B minor mass and for various uh, concerts, but uh, somehow uh, hearing them, it's very difficult to almost to put into words. I, th I mean, I, the, I think the choir has a sound that is so special, it's beyond, uh, it's, it's, which I really believe only Bob Simpson could uh, could bring about, uh, create, and it was just uh, at the end of it. I just, you know, Bob uh, took my hand, and we went out, uh, sort of acknowledged the applause of the of the congregation or the audience, whatever one wanted to call it. Uh, and it, it's a moment that I will remember all my life. Really, it was just uh, very, very special. Well, look. Gail, it's fascinating to talk to you about how um, music and journalism have been intertwined in your life. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk about your interactions with the Houston Chamber Choir, your long association with Bob Simpson. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Gail. And thank you to everybody that supports the Houston Chamber Choir, supporters, patrons, and of course, uh, you, if you're watching the podcast or listening to the podcast, thank you for your support of the Houston Chamber Choir. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and this is Behind the Music. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.